Well, you made it back to Southern Hills. Give yourself a round of applause. You did it. This is what you were waiting for all week long. Church time to worship the Lord and study his word. And that's what we're going to do right now. Ephesians chapter number six, verses five through nine is the text that we'll be studying. In the final sermon, the sermon series entitled Walk. How do we walk with Christ and walk as a Christian? The final sermon today is about your job. How exactly am I supposed to work out this Christian thing in my workplace? With a sermon entitled, The Walking Dead. I hate my job. How many of you feel that way? Don't raise your hand. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. How do you, how, how do you keep working in a job that you feel like, this is the end. I'm just done with it. I don't want to walk in this job anymore. Ephesians chapter number six, verses five through nine, deals specifically with that concept. Let's go ahead and look at it together. Ephesians chapter number six, verses five through nine. Walking dead, I hate my job. Verse five, bondservant, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. With fear and trembling and sincerity of heart, stop. Understand what's actually being said here. For this passage has been taken out of context throughout church history and done so with very nefarious and villainous intent. This passage specifically has been used throughout Christian history to oppress people in slavery, to demand of them uh, unwavering loyalty and obedience and has been used to oppress people even in our own country majorly in the South throughout the first 150 years of our government's history allowed much of this to take place. Yet this passage that was used to oppress slaves is still inspired word of God and does have an actual meaning that can help us. There's truth to it, so we need to understand what the truth actually is. Remember what the passage is originally stated for. The book of Ephesians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a group of Christians in Ephesus. And this group of Christians, Ephesus is in modern day Turkey. This group of Christians was made up of a very eclectic group, a very diverse group, ethnically diverse, but also socioeconomic status, very diverse there as well. In the Roman city of Ephesus, very much like most of the Roman mega metropolises during the time, the population was divided where nearly, some of the cities, nearly 50% of the population were classified as slaves. Slaves. And the other 50% were merchant men, or they were soldiers, or they were business owners, or they were very wealthy people. And so you had this divide. But when the church started and Jesus Christ uh, gospel of Jesus Christ spread throughout the Roman Empire. It entered into these communities, and Christians or people were getting saved out of every class of group. There were rich people getting saved and poor people getting saved. There were men getting saved, women getting saved. There were Greeks and Romans and Jews getting saved, and there were slaves and masters who were all getting saved. And then they would say, which church do we go to? And the answer is, we don't segregate. We all go to the same church. And they would all go to the same church together, which was kind of awkward. Because now you've got people who are slaves and, rich and, and poor, and you've got rich and masters, and you've got women and men, and you've got people who didn't normally socialize outside of the church. They're all in the same church, worshiping the same God, which was very beautiful because God's point was, guess what? I'm God, and you all are just people. You all are just people. Now... As God brought all of these people together, some of the questions were like, okay, as we saturate ourselves in Scripture, chapter 5, and walk in the Spirit of God, how do I work out my family life? And so he talks about that. And then he talks about how do I work out this workplace situation that I find myself in, where I'm a slave, or I'm a master, I'm a boss, I'm an employee. How does this work itself out? This is where he addresses this. He says, bond servants, be obedient to those who are your own masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. We're going to come back to that as I teach through it in a moment. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to Men, knowing that whatever good is done, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or a free man. 
Then he addresses the masters, the bosses, the employers in the room. And you masters do the same thing to them. Forgiving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven. And there is no partiality with him. Wow. So much to study and so much that applies to your life and my life today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we study this often ignored passage, I pray that you would use it. As we study this passage that has been often used to oppress people, I pray that we would get beyond the historical dynamic and see the truth and reality of how it applies to our lives and what you meant for the original hearers. And God, lastly, I pray for my friends in this room who feel stuck in a workplace that they don't like. I pray that you would speak to them. I pray that you would inspire them. I pray that you would awaken them to truth today so that you can be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Wouldn't you love it? Wouldn't it be awesome? Wouldn't it be incredible if you could work with Christians in a Christian workplace on a daily basis. I mean, I know some of you, you work downtown, some of you work in the local community, and you're not working with Christians. And I've heard oftentimes when I give talks and give sermons about the workplace, people will say, man, Pastor Josh, I wish I was able to work in a Christian community like you do, I mean, with other Christians. How many of you agree you would love to work with other Christians constantly? Would you like that, wouldn't you like that? And I've heard you say things like, Pastor, I wish I could work with people like you work with but you all have to know the people that I work with. <laughs> the, these, these are my, let, let me show you the people I work with. This is the photograph, that's a Motley crew right there if I've ever seen one. <laughs> and AJ's not even up there, Michael's not even up there. We don't tell them when we get together and have fun, they're not even allowed to be up there. <laughs> this is our community and all the ladies aren't up there, it's just a partial picture, maybe we'll get another picture for the next service, but this is the crew I work with and I have to work with them every day. And even worse, they have to work with me. Every, yeah, thank you very much for that. <laughs> but still, with that being stated, I've got to be honest. I love the people I work with, and the people that work with clearly love me. It's a, it's a great relationship for both of us. It's, it, it works out really well. And I do get this. I'm, I, I say this in all honesty. I understand the great privilege that we've been given to work with other Christians. But my challenge to you is this today. Every single one of you hear me. My challenge to you is this, that you can work in a Christian environment. You say, how? Are you going to hire me? No. 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 Because I know you. Because I know you. All right? Say, how can I work in a Christian environment? Do I need to go on the mission field like the Snooks? Here's how you work in a Christian environment. You can stay exactly in the occupation, vocation, and job God has you right now, and you can make it a Christian job. You can do that, and today I'm going to show you how from this passage. There are three steps that we see in this passage that can help you create a Christian environment by being the Christian God has called you to be. First and foremost, we have to begin with number one. Number one, you must change your boss. Can I get an amen right there? Somebody's like, oh God, hallelujah, amen, change my boss. Pastor, do you have control over that? I wish I did, but I don't. Only you do. You say, what kind of nefarious plan have you figured out to go after my boss? Here's how you do it. You stop seeing that person as the boss and you realize who your boss actually is. That is what the scripture is teaching in this passage. What I want you to see in this passage will revolutionize the way you look at your work if you'll receive it from the Lord. Look at what the Bible says. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. The same thing he says to the average Christian man in Romans chapter 13 when we are to submit ourselves to the, to, to the uh, 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 government officials, submit as to Christ, is the same thing that he says to wives in Ephesians chapter five, as we submit to our husbands, we submit to Christ, is the same thing that he says to every employee in this room. As you submit and obey, you have to understand who you're actually obeying. Christ is your boss. 
Christ, well, how many of you would like Jesus to be your boss? Don't you think Jesus would be a good boss? Man, I wish my, my boss would act more like Jesus. Look, it goes on to say, not with eye service as men pleasers. By the way, isn't that the way it works sometimes? Eye service, that means you're, you're kind of like doing nothing and all of a sudden the manager walks around and you're like, oh yeah, I'm doing something. I'm, I'm over here. I'm busy all of a sudden. I'm making more coffees than I've ever made before. You know what I mean? And I don't know, I'm not even a barista. I'm just, I'm busy doing busy stuff. Why? Because the boss is watching and he's saying, you don't work in such a way, don't work as a Christian in such a way that when that physical boss comes around, suddenly you, you're, you're busy, uh, not serving with eye, ser- uh, eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. That is, you're serving as if you are the slave of Jesus. That's what it's telling us that changes the entire perspective. Doing the will of God from the heart. Knowing that it is God's will that you are currently placed in the job that God has you. You say, but pastor, my job is bad. Why would God's will allow me to be in this bad job? What's the worst job you could possibly think of? My job, pastor. No, 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 the worst job you could possibly think of. Do you understand that he's literally writing to slaves? I know this makes our society extremely uncomfortable to be honest about what it's actually saying, but that's exactly what he's saying. And I understand this passage has been used to oppress people over the years, and it shouldn't have been, and God forsake those who abuse this passage to oppress people, wickedness. But what is it actually saying? It's saying no matter if you have the worst job in human history, in human history, you can realize, I don't serve them, I serve him. And that's the attitude of the first point. I don't serve them, I serve him. Can you say it with me? I don't serve them, I serve him. I don't serve them, I serve him. I don't serve them, I serve him. So if you're a business owner and you're starting to hate your clientele, I don't serve them, I serve him. And if you're a newly employed, em- hired employee and you're like, oh, I can't believe this boss, I don't serve them, I serve him. And if God has called you to be a missionary downtown in a corporate situation that you despise, you have to remember, I don't serve them, I serve him. Change your boss. My friend Felipe has been a member of our church for many, many years. He was sitting right back there where Anna is sitting during the first service. And I asked Felipe prior if I could share this. He said, I absolutely could. After 22 years, 22 years in a management position downtown, as many of you work downtown, 22 years, he, there was a, a new supervisor was hired over him. Don't you love it when a new manager is hired? Isn't that great? Isn't that fun? You know, you've been doing your job for two decades, and all of a sudden, man, they come in, and they know how to do your job and everybody's job better than anybody's ever done those jobs. They start putting in all sorts of policies and procedures, and they're going to change this and change that, and life is going to work finally because it never worked before they ever got there, right? And they're so excited about making your life a mess, and this was going on for poor Felipe. And he came to a place, he said, Pastor, I just did not get along with them, and they, it was clear they, hate, they don't like me. And I just didn't know what I was supposed to do. I was wondering if God even had me in this position anymore. And he said he was, I won't name where it is, he was walking through the, play, the, the mega place that he works, and he said it just hit him so hard emotionally, crumpled his spirit, he said, I just began to weep. As an adult man in his 40s, he just began to weep. God, I don't know why I'm here. What am I doing here? They hate me. I hate them. You know. He said he found a little employee-only place where he could get on his knees, and he said that's exactly what he did. He got on his knees. And by the way, some of you Christians need to take note. That is the right decision to make at that time. He got alone in a little place when he felt he could go no, on no longer. He got on his knees and he prayed. He told me, these were his words. He said, I prayed a simple prayer to God like this. God help me, I hate this place. By the way, God loves those kind of simple prayers. I've had people say, I don't know really how to pray. I don't know how to pray. I wish I knew all the words. God just wants your words. Amen. Just your words. God help me, I hate this place. And he said, in that moment, I felt God's peace come over my soul. And he said, in just like 
10 seconds later, he stood up and he felt, I can do this. I can do this. And this is the words he said, because I'm not working to help make them happy. I'm here because God wants me here for him and for his family. That's what he told me. He said, I realize God wants me here for him and for his family. He is still telling you exactly what Paul is telling you, and that is this, don't miss it, don't miss it. I'm not here for them, I'm here for him. Change your boss, change your boss, change your boss, number one. Number two, Number two, the second thing you can do to make it a Christian workplace is change your attitude. If suddenly Jesus was your boss, <laughs> and then suddenly your attitude changed, everything changes, friend. And that's what Paul says to these individuals in the next few verses. Um, he says in verses seven through nine, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Notice that, with good will. It's talking about attitude. That is, you can do your, how many of you realize you can do your job with a good attitude or a bad attitude? Uh, one of my jobs is to have Fridays with the pastor where I ha go to coffee with a lot of you folks. In fact, that's how Felipe and I were spending that time together. And if you've never done a coffee time with me, you are missing out on one of the greatest joys of life. Let me just tell you right there. I drink coffee with the best of them. And it's not just me, all of our pastors and ministry leaders, man, you could go out with coffee with Heather and, and Caleb and, and Blake and all these people, and you set it up, set it up. And I'm talking, I love these. But you know, sometimes, this is gonna shock you, shock you. Sometimes, I, I don't feel like being there. You say, well, you, what are you talking about, Pastor? You just met with seven other people and now you get to be with me. I know. <laughs> like, I, I know, I, I know. And I really had a good time with those seven. But then I saw your name. <laughs> here's the facts, here's the facts. There's a choice that has to be made in those moments. And the, and the choice is all about attitude. And, and you have to make the same choice in your moment, don't you? About the job that God has called you to do in the moment that God has called you to do it. He, here's the point. As servants of Christ, I have become a servant to all. Amen. That's the point of the verses we're about to read, verses 7 through 9. As a servant of Christ, I have become a servant to all. Say it with me. As a servant of Christ, I have become a servant to all. You say, I'm a, I'm a small business owner. I don't work for anybody. Well, you're going to be out of job soon. Because if you're a small business owner, all you do is serve everybody. Amen? As a servant of Christ, I have become a servant to all. Say it with me. As a servant of Christ, I have become a servant to all. So he goes on. He goes on. With goodwill doing service as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he's a slave or free. You see, I don't think they're recognized what I bring to the table, and they're definitely not compensating me the way they should. God says if you work for him, he'll, t he'll compensate you. Amen. He'll compensate you. That's what he's saying. You say, man, I'm... I'm glad, I'm glad I'm not an employee. I'm glad I'm a master. Oh, here's a verse for you. It says in verse nine, by the way, those who used verses six through eight to oppress people in the past very rarely ever looked at verse nine. Verse nine that says, and you masters do the same things to them. Do what things? Serve them. Buried in the gospel was a clear path for slavery to be eradicated in Western culture and around the world if we follow the scripture. And it took centuries for Christians to finally bring this to light. But what it said to the masters way back in the time of Rome is, guess what? If you have servants, it's your job to serve them. Serve them, which in modern terminology means this. If you're a boss, your number one job is to take care of your employees. Wouldn't it be amazing if American culture would understand that? Wouldn't it be amazing if, if modern corporations would understand that? Wouldn't it be amazing if there were some CEOs in this room who understood this or watched online that your number one job is to take care of your customers, your number one job is to take care of your employees, your last job is to take care of yourself? 
That's the gospel truth from Ephesians. Look, it goes on to explain verse, verse 9. And, but, but this is why it's not very popular. Look, it goes on. And you masters do the same thing to them, giving up threatening. <laughs> that is, stop threatening those who work for you. If you don't get this, if you don't, I'm going to. You say, why don't I threaten them? Knowing that you also have a master in heaven and there is no partiality with him. When a master, an employer, a boss gets to a place, if you're a manager, I'm going to be very blunt with you. You need to get to a place where you understand you got a boss too. Isn't it good that he treats you as nice that he treats you? How about treat those who work for you well? What are you doing to serve them? It's a change of attitude. You have to have a paradigm shift. See things differently. Remember your first car? Do you, do you, remember, do you remember your first car? Justin, do you remember your first car? How many of you remember your first car? Mine was a 1978 Buick LeSabre white. <laughs> it's not because I was old, because I had a poor family. That's why that was my... Uh, the giant car. When I rode in this car, it was like a boat. It would float down the road. It really was. You remember your first, Justin, what was your first car? Do you remember what it was? Say, yell it out real loud. A Chevy Cavalier. A Chevy Cavalier. What color, what year? Oh. What a heap of junk. Wow. That's, <laughs> wow. Somebody else. Anybody remember your first? Yes. What was your, Mark, what was your first car? Did you? He said a 1967 Plymouth Fury. And what color was it? Oh, that's the right choice. That's, that's not bad. T, what was yours? T, what was yours? 1969 Mercury Cougar. Blue Mercury Cougar from 1969. Oh, my word. Now, dude, you're like, please, yes. A 72 Ford Pinto. Dude, you were a nerd before it was cool. Wow, wow. Have you ever noticed this about whenever you get a car? You get a Pinto. <laughs> oh, dear God, help us, right? Or you get a, a, a Fury. What happens is interesting, and this will happen to you the next time you buy a car. What happens to you is the moment you get that car, suddenly you begin to see that car everywhere. Isn't that weird? Like you buy a car or you get a car and you could be driving the same path to work every day. Drive to work 20 minutes, drive back from work 20 minutes and you never notice that car. Then you buy that car and all of a sudden you see that car everywhere. Did you know there's an actual term for that? Psychologists refer to that phenomenon as Bader-Meinhof phenomenon, more commonly referred to as frequency illusion. It's the concept that now that your brain has taken note of a new car, it will alert you when it sees it elsewhere, on the road, on TV, in a conversation. You just begin to see it. You see it everywhere. Why? Well, because your brain is created by God in such a powerful way as a computer that you see so many things, you're not supposed to process everything. So your mind deletes all sorts of information that is irrelevant to you. And then all of a sudden, something happens in your life, something's seen in your life, you're part of something in your life, and now you're zoned in on that one thing. Now you see it everywhere. This is why some people are so dramatic. You ever know some people are just extremely drama focused? They love drama, 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 drama. They watch drama on television. They go to the movies and watch drama. They read dramatic magazines and dramatic movies or books. Every time you talk, they've got a drama they want to tell you about. They're just filled with drama. They love drama. And they'll tell you, I hate this drama, but let me tell you about this thing. You know, they're very dramatic people. <laughs> I just can't stand the drama, right? This is the idea of these people. Drama. drama. You know why? Here's why. Because they've experienced drama, and they've seen it, and it's affected them emotionally. Now, everywhere they look, without them even knowing it, subconsciously, they're looking for drama. They're looking for it. They're looking for it. Some people are looking for drama, so they're going to find drama. Some people are looking for trauma, so they will find trauma. Some people are looking for hate, so they'll find hate. Some people are looking for racism, so they'll find racism. 
Some people are looking for injustice, so they'll find injustice. Some people are looking for inequality, so they'll find the inequality. Some people are looking for joy, so they will find joy. And some people are looking for peace, so they will find peace. And some people are looking for love, so they will find love. I'm telling you, friend, what you look for, you will find. You are creating narrow pathways in your mind to find the same thing over and over and over and over. And no matter how good this world gets, you'll still be able to find what's wrong with it. And you'll live in that depression the rest of your life. Could it be possible that your job is so bad because you've trained your mind to only look for the bad things in your job? Maybe what we need to do is break our mindset of that and begin realizing, change your mind, change your boss, change your perspective on these things. Change what you're looking at. Start seeking joy in your job. Start seeking peace in your job. Start seeking love in your job. Look for friendship, look for goodness, look for meekness, look for self-control. Why? Because as a servant of Christ, I've become a servant to all. First we see this is how to create a Christian environment. By the way, God could place you in the dream job and if all you look for is the bad, you'll never be happy. God could place you in the perfect society. And if all you look for is the bad, you'll never be happy in this society. Right. I gotta be honest, I really do struggle with that. Focusing on the positive, not the negative. Number one, first and foremost, change your boss. Number two, change your attitude. Number three, change your perspective. Change your perspective, friend. This is the phrase I want you to say with me in this final point. He is the chess master. I'm just the pawn. Can you say that? Some of you are like, no! Because I'm an American and I'm the captain of my ship and the, the, the captain of my destiny and I'm in charge of me. Okay, okay, I know, you're amazing and you're fantastic. He is the chess master, I am the pawn. See, this is the big problem. I think a lot of us think of ourselves as the person in front of the chessboard and we're playing 10 moves ahead of everybody else. You ain't the chess master. Now, you might be a knight, you see? You might be a castle, you might be a bishop, but you're not the chess master. He is the chess master, you're a, you're a pawn. Are you, wait a second, are you telling me that this whole thing is not about me? It's not about you. Your life is not about you. Your life is about your creator. Amen. And if you are a born again Christian, he not only created you, when you ran from God in sin, he by grace saved your wretched soul and brought you into his family. You were bought with a price. You are no longer your own. You've been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Your life is not yours. You're not the chess master. He's the chess master. You're the pawn. Can you say it with me? Those of you who can, in good conscience, say it with me. He's the chess master. I'm the pawn. Oh, wow. That was quick. <laughs> I was going to prep it. You're like, blah, blah, blah. okay. Let's say it together. He's the chess master. I'm the pawn. I know some of you are not yet believers, and we're really glad you're here. You're seeking after truth, and that bothers you. You don't like that. That's fine, keep seeking. Hopefully you will see the truth one day. But if you're a Christian, this should free you. The best example in my mind is Joseph. Joseph's awesome. Joseph's story. Joseph was a little shepherd boy in the book of Genesis. He watched his father's sheep. He was the second, of 12, uh, the second to last, 11th of 12 boys in his family. Anybody come from a big family? Huh, anybody? 12, 12. That's a lot of kids. And he was the second to the youngest, so he watched all the sheep. And one day, his older brothers wanted to play a joke, so they dug a pick, they threw him in the pit, um, which is not nice. And, um, and it was a really funny joke. Then they sold him as a slave. Ha, huh, good times. Now, the reason they did this, if you read the text, is because he was kind of a little punk and said a lot of things he probably shouldn't have said. Why do you say this, Josh? Well, because I'm an older brother. So you understand I have a certain perspective <laughs> on things. Anyway, they took Joseph. His first job was a shepherd. I'm going to say, what was his first job? You say shepherd. What was his first job? Shepherd. 
as he was a little shepherd boy, here's what his, at, his attitude was. God, you're the chess master, I'm the pawn. If you want me to be a shepherd boy, I'll be a shepherd boy. His next job, as he was sold into slavery, he became a slave. I'm gonna ask, what was his second job? You say slave. What was his second job? Slave. slave. You know what his attitude as a slave was? God, you're the chess master, I'm the pawn. You just put me wherever you want me. He got promoted from slave when he was accused by the master's wife. When she tried to seduce him, he ran away from her. She accused him of something, and then he got thrown into prison. So he got promoted from slave to prisoner. His third job was prisoner. I'm going to say, what was his third job? You say prisoner. What was his third job? Prisoner. And you know what his attitude as a prisoner was? Hey, I'm, I'm your pawn. You're the chess master. You put me wherever you want me. He worked hard in that prison situation, and very clearly from the text in Genesis, he was promoted in the prison to become like a ruler in the prison, like a ruler in the prison. And then after he became a ruler in the prison, somebody found out about him, and he got promoted out of the prison, and because of a series of events, you'll have to read the book of Genesis, spoiler, I don't want to give it away, he becomes the second in command of all of Egypt, the assistant pharaoh, or maybe more assistant to the pharaoh. I don't know how it worked exactly, but he was the second in charge of all of Egypt. I'm going to say, what was his last job? You say, second in charge of all of Egypt. What was his last job? Second in charge of all of Egypt. And you know what his attitude was? Finally, I did it for myself. <laughs> was that his attitude? You're the chess master, I'm the pawn. You put me where you want me. So if you need a prisoner that's a Christian right now, I'll be a prisoner. And maybe you need a missionary as a slave right now, so I'll be a missionary. And maybe you need a missionary as a valet at the Mandalay Bay. For as long as you need a missionary there, I'll be that. And maybe you need a line cook downtown. And if you need a line cook downtown, I'm willing to be that for you. And maybe you need a missionary as a police officer from Metro. And if you need a missionary as a police officer Metro, I'm going to be your... Mi and maybe you need another Christian small business owner who creates jobs for people in this community. And if you want me to be that, I will be that for you. And what I'll do is I'll serve my clients and I will serve my customers and I will serve, I will serve my employees. If you want me to be that, I'll be that for you. Why? Because you're the chess master, I'm the pawn. Did you realize that you're a missionary? I'm, I'm thankful for Brandon and Kate. God called them from here to go to Togo, West Africa, the uttermost parts of the world. But do you understand that they will actually be closer to where Jesus said that than you are? You're further away from, the God, you're further away from Jerusalem than they are, which means you're a missionary here, here, here. So maybe God wants you exactly where he has you. And maybe what you're supposed to do is just simply change your boss, change your attitude, and change your perspective on all of this. And then every day, you'll be serving in a Christian workplace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the chance that you've given us to study it this universal principle that works in every society for every person throughout Christian history. I pray that we would apply it to our lives in Las Vegas. In Jesus' name we pray.